Holy City Center Radio, this is episode 181, and I am your host, Christian Sanger. Today is Wednesday, October 11th, 2023. I wish I could tell you the drama surrounding the Charleston County School District's Board of Trustees was over or showing any signs of waning, and I cannot do that. Uh, Pretty much this whole episode will be dedicated to uh, latest updates on that whole situation, Uh, but you do want to hear it, trust me, especially uh, some accusations that, I mean, it's hard to even call them accusations when it's pretty clear whose voice is on these uh, this video. I'll tell you more about that in a moment, but uh, that's the biggest story in Charleston right now. I know, I know some of you probably sick of it, sick of dealing with some of these people and their shenanigans, but these are important updates as we're possibly going to be seeing some sort of, you know, punishment or maybe some changes. We'll see, but we'll get you caught up on all that in a moment. For now, a quick life update. Not too much going on as far as any events or anything I've done since the uh, Monday episode. Uh, As usual, beginning of the week, pretty quiet. I actually don't have a ton scheduled as of this recording. That, of course, could change at any moment, Uh, but pretty quiet around here. But some exciting things in the works. I kind of alluded to them in past episodes. You know, at the end of August, beginning of September, I mentioned that I left my full-time job. I'm now doing Holy City Center full-time, but that's not it. I'm also part of a new company as well uh, that is involved with Holy City Center. I can't really get into too too many details yet, but I will certainly pass along information when I can. Uh, But that partnership, I can tell you about what some changes are coming. Uh, Holy City Center will have a new website design here in the somewhat near future, should be a lot easier to use, uh, more stories for you to see up front instead of having to scroll so often, should just be a better um, user interface. And that'll include uh, eventually a new events calendar as well. I like the program I have now, but should be having an integrated one uh, that will have a, a couple more options than the current one I have. So I'm looking forward to those changes. I'm excited. I think it's going to be um, welcome change to the site. Um, and it's just the first step of many things to come. So excited about that. I've been working on it. And like I said, I'll have more information for you all in the future. But for now, let's get into the latest news. All right, before we get into the board, the big picture of the Charleston County School District Board of Trustees and what's been going on there. Something happened over uh, the last few days uh, that is finally catching the attention of some legacy media here in town. So a community activist recently released video recordings that seem to pretty clearly show Charleston County School Board Vice Chair and District 5 Representative Carlotta Bailey stating that there is no such thing as gay children and that black parents are mostly to blame for racial achievement gaps in schools. Yes, that is correct. One of the board members is on video saying that. Now, why do I say, you know, at the beginning, it it seems to be, well, the video doesn't ever show Bailey, you know, on the actual video. It was clear she did not know she was being recorded. The community activist, whose name is Elvin Spates, uh, or Spites, he had uh, recorded it on his cell phone. It appears to be a cell phone, you know, just like the standard video, you know, that you would take a video of, you know, that the standard native app on a, like an iPhone or an Android or whatever it may be. And he kind of has the phone the screen is pointed up to the ceiling. Most of the time it was clear that he didn't want Bailey to know she was being recorded. And we'll we'll get into that in a moment. So, you know, you'll, you'll see uh, outlets like the post and courier saying like allegedly and purportedly. And even though the, the woman's voice on the video sounds just like miss Bailey's and supposedly the activist has shown the post and courier, some like text messages and, and communications with Bailey showing that they had a meeting scheduled and where it was scheduled and, you know, some other supporting information. So it certainly seems, you know, 99.9% sure that it is Bailey on these recordings. All right. So now that we got that out of the way, The activist posted them on Facebook on October 6th. Someone that follows me alerted me to that. I went and watched them. I then shared the information on Twitter. Um, And now, like I said, Post and Courier has picked it up. Uh, 
Spates Spites, I'm, I, I apologize, I don't know how to pronounce his name, but he attended a morning press conference at uh, North Charleston City Hall on October 9th with two other community leaders to condemn Bailey's alleged remarks and ask for her resignation. For Bailey's part, she has not responded to multiple calls, text messages, and emails seeking comment from the Post and Courier or any other local media outlets for that matter. So in the video, the woman who, again, certainly seems to be Bailey, is heard saying things like being gay was, quote, not God's desire, end quote, and then went on to say things like there's no such thing as gay children. Those children are confused about who they are and what they are. Those children, if they're not of legal age to vote, and you're not of a legal age to vote until you're 18, you cannot make conscious decisions about what gender they are. Yikes. That, of course, flies in the face of all evidence and science and research. Uh, it's, it's just not true. There obviously is such a thing as gay children. Um, she also learned, she's alluding to, you know, uh, being... Uh, not she said gay children, but she's also talking about trans children as she talks about, you know, being to talk about what gender they are or, or someone's gender fluid or whatever it may be that it just flies. Like I said, this is, it's just false. Her statements are patently false. Now her personal beliefs, religious wise, whatever that's, that's a, that's between her and her God, but saying that this gay kids don't exist and because they're not 18, they somehow can't realize if they're gay or trans again is just, Play, patently false and in this year of 2023 is gross that there's so many people that still think that this is not a choice people are born this way you all get that i don't need to get up higher at a soapbox over that in any event uh the activist said he recorded bailey during that october 3rd meeting uh and, and said that she bailey that is had requested the meeting uh and then he said he recorded her remarks for what he said was his own protection so in these discussions, he continues on saying uh, discussions about sexuality have no place in the classroom. Um, you know, and she said classrooms are for English, language arts, math and, and other academic subjects. The woman also said that she opposed Pride Month and that people in the LGBTQ commu community are, in her words, trying to make something that's personal a civil right. So, again, just homophobic, bigoted, misinformed, ignorant comments. And then she also went on to speak about the racial achievement gaps between black children in the district and their white peers. Now, it should be noted that Bailey is a black woman. That doesn't mean that her comments are, uh, you know, OK, then, because uh, these were also not so great. Uh, she said black children are behind academically because most black families have a different concept of the value of education whatever the hell that means. Uh, she said black parents often don't help their children with their homework after school or read to them. I, just bonkers. See how I was saying, like, just because she's black doesn't mean that these comments are okay. Just bonkers. I just can't believe she was saying these things. I know she didn't, it appears she did not know she was being recorded, but still, uh, at one point in her sort of defense isn't really the word I want to use, but she did clarify in the recording later on that she wasn't talking about all black parents. That's why I said not really in her defense, because it's still not that great. Um, she also said black students, academic struggles aren't caused by systemic racism, but by their families. Again, just there's plenty of studies and evidence out there to the contrary. And, and even, <laughs> and that's before she added the qualifier about, uh, the issues of the families. Uh, sure. Any family, regardless of background, any student that is struggling, yeah, there's a chance that their home life is contributing to that. But for her to place that on black, uh, black family specifically is just outrageous. Another interesting part in the recording, it's certainly problematic and not something that a leader should be saying or how they should be voting, but isn't as, you know, it doesn't fall under the racism or bigoted or homophobic or whatever category. But she said that she didn't move forward with Michelle Simmons, who, who is also a black woman who was in an interim role with uh, for over a year with CCSD and all these moms for Liberty back candidates that we've talked about, including Bailey, decided not to give her the full-time position. A lot of people have accused this of being a racist act. 
you know, there's been other accusations. So according to Bailey, when she was asked about why she didn't, you know, vote for this woman to get the job, despite it seeming like she's been doing a very good job in that role, she said that the, the reason behind her decision was that black community leaders called her trying to influence her vote. I listened to the recording, and yes, it, it seems as though because people were reaching out to her and saying, you should vote for this person, you really need to do this, she just did the opposite because of that. She didn't like being told what to do by black community leaders. And I don't know how they said that, you know, how they communicated with her about this. They could have been rude. They could have said something that upset her. She didn't really elaborate. But whatever... The, whatever happened, they asked her to vote for this person, and that is why she just went and did the opposite. Again, that is based on her words in the video. That is not how you lead. When people in the community tell you they want you to do something and, and you do the opposite just to make them mad, just because they told you to do it, that's not how it works. Now, if the black community leaders that she said tried to influence her vote aren't her constituents, you know, if they're in a different district, if they're not even in, you know, Charleston County, you know, that could be a reason like, Hey, I, I listened to them. I appreciate what they said, but they are not in the County. I have to listen to my constituents and my constituents did not want Simmons to have a full-time role. That's different, but she didn't say that. She just said, because she was uh, asked by these community leaders, to vote for the full-time position, she went and did the opposite. Insane. So for those wondering about this whole recording thing, South Carolina is a state that has what's called one-party consent. That just means that in a recording, one person who is being recorded has to um, consent to it. Obviously, if you're the person doing the recording, you're consenting to it. So that's why um, she was allowed to be recorded. It's not illegal. You may think it was, you know, you may think there's some ethics, ethical questions behind that. And that's understandable. Uh, but it's not illegal in South Carolina is, you know, so if I were, if you were on a phone call and I recorded your phone call with another person and neither of you knew I was recording you, that's illegal. But if I called you and recorded the conversation, never said a word to you, it's legal because I'm one of the people being recorded. Get it? So that's how it works legally here in South Carolina. So that's that situation. Community leaders have asked her to resign. Uh, they said these comments are inappropriate. And there, there's been, you know, it runs the gamut from people just outright calling it what it seems to be, you know, homophobic, bigoted. Um, and then some other people saying, hey, it might be that stuff. I, I, you know, some people don't like to get into the whole isms and, you know, calling people out for things like that. So a couple of people are like, well, it's, it's certainly toxic at best. <laughs> and that's not a good place to be. So we'll see what happens there. Like I said, Bailey is not publicly commented about this, whether on her own Facebook, um, social media, which some of these members tend to do instead of talking to the media, uh, but she hasn't spoken to the media either. So I'll provide any updates, but just unreal comments that she was making with someone uh, again, whether she knew she was recorded or not. Uh, wow. Uh, when, when people tell you who they are, you need to believe them. And we knew this about these candidates. This is now the second one. The second board member that is backed by Moms for Liberty that has gotten in trouble for something they allegedly said, as we may remember, Ed Kelly uh, was taken off um, some committees and or stripped of some roles after you may remember that whole kerfuffle where he was supposedly at a Moms for Liberty meeting. And someone reported that he had made some comment that like if his kid had a trans student or I'm sorry, uh, if his kid had a trans teacher he basically alluded that they're lucky because some parents would show up with a gun and was kind of alluding that he would show it. It was just disgusting. He denied ever saying it, but you know, what's he going to say? Like, yeah, I did. Uh, so who, you know, so allegedly he said that. And now we still, I guess have to say allegedly about Bailey, even though this one is recorded and certainly seems to be her. Um, so again, we knew what was really going on. These folks are not serious about, governing or whatever the appropriate term is for a school board. They're not interested in leading. They had an agenda. 
that is pushed by a group that has uh, donated to them and is pushing policy all around the country. And it's not about the kids at all. It's just making things worse, trying to own the libs and upset people who, you know, uh, tend to lean left. Uh, But it's, as we've seen here, it's been refreshing to see that across the aisle and not just, you know, actual politicians, but community members, regardless of party, calling these folks out for these egregious things that they're doing. And in that vein, the Charleston County House delegation met this past Monday to continue talking about all of this drama, including the legality of placing Dr. Ehrlich Gallion, the superintendent, on paid administrative leave. Uh, They also are looking at issues surrounding compliance with South Carolina law. There's been a lot of speculation at first, and it seems now that people have looked into it, that the law has been broken in terms of how they are, uh, you know, certain policies that they are implementing and putting out there during meetings. And we'll we'll get into that a little bit. And and again, this isn't just, it's not speculation anymore. It's not people in the community making accusations when not really knowing the story. The attorney general believes they've broken the law. And the attorney general is a very conservative Republican. So, again, it's refreshing to see people on both sides of the aisle saying, hey, this isn't right. Even if they may agree politically with some of the things these members are doing, I appreciate that they're saying, yeah, this isn't how it's supposed to be done at all. So we'll get into that a little bit more in a moment. But back to this meeting, it was held at North Charleston Council Chambers. It was packed. I wasn't there, but I was watching on a live stream. The video did show the crowd periodically as well as the House delegation who were, you know, up on like a dais. And it was packed in there. And dozens of people got up to speak. It was a several hours long meeting. It was mostly community comments. Periodically, some of these House members would ask questions. Um, The meeting started with three of the board members who wanted Dr. Galleon to stay in his role. They talked about their disappointment and kind of reiterated some of the comments you've seen in, you know, local media and, and maybe online and things like that. I missed a small portion of the meeting when I was doing work, but the vast, I mean, I didn't see a single person come up and defend the Moms for Liberty back candidates or even allude to maybe they're doing the right thing. There was a couple people who were like, hey, I'm just starting to learn about all this, so I don't really know what's going on. But regardless of who's right, there's a lot of chaos here, and this is embarrassing. So no one outright came out and defended them. I think it, uh, no, I think, I know at one point during the video, um, someone on the dais asked, you you know, after it was clear that like everyone that was coming up was just like, you people, meaning the Moms for Liberty back candidates, are out of control. We don't support you. You're doing the wrong things. Someone at the dais was like, okay, is there anyone who agrees with what these board members have done? And although it wasn't clear on the video, It seems like based on comments in the room that I could hear, there was one, maybe two people that raised their hands to show support. Uh, So the vast majority, you know, well over, you know, 95 percent of the people in attendance at least were if the hand raising, no one was afraid to do it. So being generous, I'll say 95 percent of the people there were there to speak out against what specifically that small faction of the board has done. And uh Again, I missed a tiny portion of public comment, so I don't know if any of those people who raised their hand got up to speak. But again, regardless, it wasn't even close. Now, the people who spoke uh, range from parents, community members and activists, teachers, and even some students from CCSD. Uh, You know, who wasn't there and who didn't speak were the five Moms for Liberty back candidates. None of them showed up. No surprise there. They have no interest in transparency or explaining themselves and why should they because they have the majority and can pretty much get away with whatever they want or at least i'm sure that's the thinking at this point now during the meeting uh there were some potential um solutions discussed and some pass forward it was shared that south carolina attorney general who i mentioned before alan worth uh, alan wilson a conservative republican a hardcore Trump supporter, was sent a letter from Representative Marvin Pendarvis, who requested a response for him about this situation. Attorney General Wilson responded, and his letter said in part that based upon prior opinions 
and the decisions of courts, we believe a court would likely conclude that the Freedom of Information Act's requirements for convening an executive session were not met. So basically, he was saying they broke state law as a regard in regards to Freedom of Information Act using these executive sessions where they're not open in public. It doesn't appear they're doing the right thing. And he was confident that one of our local courts here in South Carolina would agree with that designation. So that's pretty telling. Again, when someone like Wilson is saying that this again, I know a lot of times with politics like, oh, everyone on the right hates everything that people on the left do and vice versa. This is a rare show of bipartisanship that this board is out of control, specifically those members. Now, another thing that legislators heard from the community and then said that they were looking into was that there needs to be some mechanism to remove board members who aren't fulfilling their duties or or violating board policies or or whatever it may be. As it stands right now, only the governor uh, can remove board members, and it's you know a, a, a small list of things that. Uh, he can do that, you know, that he can take into account and use as the basis to kick someone off a board. It's similar to city councils. You remember we went through this with Harry Griffin and we, everyone was like, how can we get this guy off the board? And this is when we learned that it comes down to really the governor and there's no other policy in place for that. Uh, Representative Pendarvis said uh, legislators are currently limited in how they can respond, uh, but they will be returning to their official session in January, you know, uh, up in Columbia, and they are working to get the ball rolling towards some sort of solution, whether that be ranked choice voting or making these elections go to runoffs. Because another point that people brought up was none of these, I'm sorry, one of the Moms for Liberty backed members got 50 percent or more of the vote. So because there isn't a runoff when there's a handful of candidates, they don't need to get any certain percentage to, you know, to to get elected. In other races, uh, you know, city council, mayoral, whatever it may be, if there is more than two candidates and no one gets 50 percent of the vote, it's usually the top two move on to a runoff. The thought being, all right, we'll get the two most popular people. And then the folks who uh, did get votes that aren't allowed to move on because they didn't get enough, those votes will now go to one of these two. So only one member actually hit that threshold, which means the majority of people who voted did not vote for these members not really how democracy should work right now of course it is still democracy it still is the highest percentage gets it but it seems ridiculous that someone could win 33 percent of a vote or whatever and now they can make these insane choices when you get 33 percent of the vote that means the vast majority of voters did not want you in that role now if it went to a runoff they may have gotten over that 50 percent mark and then hey there you go but we don't know what would have happened. So that was one uh, thing they were talking about. There was some discussion about, well, runoffs might be too long of a process. That's when someone brought up ranked choice voting, you know, where you say, I vote for this person. They're my first choice. If they don't make it, I my second choice is this person. And then that's how uh, it could be determined. So those things were discussed. And, and we'll see what happens. Could there be some furtherance from Attorney General Wilson or Governor McMaster if changes aren't made? Could be. Um, Could someone sue over these uh, what appears to be illegal um, executive sessions um, violating state law when it comes to these meetings? Yeah, that could certainly happen as well. Uh, But as far as any way to fix the voting situation or remove members in a different way, uh, we're going to have to wait and see if anything comes up in the, you know, in the state legislature. And although it's been nice seeing the bipartisan support in the Charleston area, um, when you talk about the South Carolina state Senate and state house of representatives as a whole, I don't hold your breath that things will get done on that level. This, a lot of the politicians there want these people in these roles. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Uh, one other thing I wanted to know is that the students there um, at the meeting all also supported Dr. Eric Gallion, did not support what the board had been doing, saying that politics have trickled down into their classrooms, and they felt that they had to be at the meeting to say something, even though they were supposed to be in school. So they took time out of their day because they felt it was that important. They said both teachers and students are frustrated that the board of trustees, at the board of trustees rather, in their recent decisions, and said that they spoke to the delegation for their teachers on their behalf because many of them were afraid that they might be met with retaliation if they came to 
to this meeting. So just shows you how much of a mess this whole thing is. I know that was a long update, but there was a lot going on, especially when we're talking about Carlotta Bailey and the this horrible things she said. And, and now the fallout from a couple weeks ago, the votes and everything else that's been going on, the drama continues. And as I keep saying, no signs of slowing down. Hopefully we'll have some good updates in the future. All right. Lastly, um, Vice President Kamala Harris is going to be speaking at the College of Charleston today. Uh, she's going to be doing a few things around campus. The big main event will be held at the Satili Theater um, at 1 p.m. This is all part of her Fight for Our Freedoms College Tour. Um, it is only open to students, so if, unless you're a College of Charleston student, you wouldn't be able to attend. Uh, but just know that the Vice President will be in town. So especially if you're downtown around, you know, lunchtime hours, you may run into some traffic, you know, if there's a motorcade or whatever else may go into that, you know, how secret service will be here and police uh, detail and all that stuff. So it could be a little, um, could be a little hectic at certain points. Uh, the tour focuses on what the white house says is key issues that disproportionately infect, or I'm sorry, impact young people across America. Uh, the release states that the tour touches on issues from reproductive freedom and gun safety to climate action, voting rights, LGBTQ plus equality, mental health, and book bans. So um, students, if you are a College of Charleston student, uh, that will be going on today at 1 p.m. at the Satili Theater. You do have to register. Um, and for those thinking, oh, I'm not a student, but I'll register. I believe when I looked at the registration page, you have to have like a CFC email. So uh, not quite open to the entire community. Uh, but again, wanted to share that because it's always big when a uh, president or vice president comes into town uh, for you know news purposes, but also because it can certainly affect traffic. And you know, people are always like, "What is all this stuff going on?" <laughs> you know, when they run into a motorcade. So that's your heads up for today. That'll do it for this edition of Holy City Center Radio. I hope you um, have a great rest of your week. I can't wait to talk to you on Friday. Thank you to Lindsay Marie Collins for producing this with LMC Sound System. And thank you to Tyler Boone, whose music you hear in each and every episode. If you have a chance, go ahead and like, rate, review, subscribe, whatever you can do on the streaming platform you're listening on. Please do so right now. That helps get this podcast out to other people. You can also help out by going to holycitycenter.com slash shop to pick up some merchandise or patreon.com slash holycitycenter to sign up for one of those support tiers. I will speak to you all again in just a couple days on Friday's episode. Until then, though, good night and good luck. Good luck.